previously on Science for All. Is the theory of relativity relative? And now the answer. Well, everything is relative. Wait, no. If everything was relative, then the sentence everything is relative would not be relative. And it would contradict itself. Therefore, not everything is relative. And that's something that's not relative. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But there was a point there, wasn't there? I mean, if you're trying to build a theory based on relativity, then there's not much you can say. In fact, any theory has to be built upon something that is not relative, something that is absolute, that is true in every circumstances. And that's what the theory of relativity actually does. That's what Einstein did. In fact, he wanted to call his theory the invariance theory, but it didn't catch up. So what's invariant in Einstein's theory of relativity? Well, in short, you can say that Newtonian mechanics, which was believed to be the truth back then in Einstein's time, considered that space and time were absolute, while speeds are all relative. And by building upon mathematical theories as well as experimental results, Einstein had the great idea of inverting it. He considered that space and time were no longer absolute, they were relative, while one speed was absolute, and that is the speed of light. Now what's amazing is that by postulating that the speed of light was invariant for all observers, Einstein managed to derive the structure of space and time. Are you excited? You'd better be. I know I am. First things first, space and time are just really one entity. Cold space-time. That wasn't hard, was it? Now, space-time is relative. This means that whatever measurements you do in your space-time may be totally different from the measurements that I make in my space-time. Suppose that you're measuring time in your rocket by using a beam of light that goes up and down. Let's say it has a distance of one light second to travel from down to up. This means that it will take it one second to go from down to up and thus two seconds to come back down. Now the thing is that in my space time, the rocket is moving as light is moving as well. So the trajectory of the beam of light in my space time is diagonal. And this means that the distance light has traveled between going down to up and then down again is going to be bigger in my space time than in yours. But the speed of light is the same for all observers. It's the same for you, it's the same for me. So light has traveled more space in my space time than in yours while going at the same speed. This must have meant that more time has gone for me in my space time than for you in your space time. In other words, in my space time, a clock in your rocket is ticking slower than a clock in my hand. What's even weirder is that in your space time, I'm the one who's moving fast, and thus, it is my clock that is ticking slower. More generally, in any space-time, moving clocks tick slower. And this is not just some theoretical fantasy. It's actually something that has been observed. For instance, the cosmic rays that come from out there in the universe and that hit our atmospheres produce new particles. And one of these particles is the muon. Now the muon doesn't live for very long, it lived for 2.2 microseconds. <laughs> I can't believe he died. <laughs> he was so young. I mean, who dies at 2.2 microseconds old? Now based on the fact that it only lives such a short period of time, and it's produced so far up there in the atmosphere, if you really were in Newtonian mechanics, it shouldn't be observed on the surface of the Earth. But it is. That's because in our space-time, the muon is moving so fast that its internal clock is ticking much, 
much slower than our clocks on Earth. Thus, if we measure his lifetime with our clocks on Earth, we will measure a much greater lifetime than the muon would measure with his own clock. This allows him to have enough time in our space-time to travel all the way to the surface of the Earth where we thus can and do observe him. But then, what happens from the muon's perspective? I mean, the muon is not moving with respect to itself, so time should not be dilated for himself, so he should only live 2.2 microseconds in his space-time, right? You're right. You're absolutely right. So what's going on in the muon's space-time? In the muon's space-time, time is running as it should for him, which means that he will only live 2.2 microseconds. However, space is going to be modified. In fact, space is going to contract just enough so that it compensates the dilation of time in our space-time. Which means that from the muon's perspective, the space in front of him is going to shrink. The Earth is going to be flat for him, as we've already discussed in this video. And in particular, the space between him and the surface of the Earth will be much smaller than it is in our space-time. In fact, it will be so small that the muon will be able to travel it in less than 2.2 microseconds. Moreover, from his space-time, we are moving at extreme speeds, so we are slowing down. So the muon gets to see a flat Earth where everything is slowed down. Now, this blows my mind. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed these videos. The uh, relativity is just so, so cool. I'm so excited to get into this, this kind of topic. And in fact, we're going to go all the way up to the theory of general relativity, which is just so much cooler than the special relativity theory. You'll see. Now, you've probably heard that the geometry of space-time is actually curved in general relativity. So, before actually talking about general relativity, I want to tell you about, a little bit about the geometry of curved spaces, and you'll see that it's so, 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 so cool. Uh, in particular, the first thing I want you to do is to take a square. So, this is perfectly flat, right? And the part I want you to solve, or try to solve at least, is to try to glue opposite ends together. So here I've glued these two, these two edges together. Now, can I glue also the two uh, other edges together? In other words, is it possible to glue these two sides together and these two sides together all at once? Well. I didn't succeed. Now, obviously, in practice, it's uh, something that's very hard to do, but could it be done, actually, even in theory? Is there a theoretical way to exactly glue the opposite edges of a square? Try to think about this, and as you'll see, it will lead us to some beautiful, like literally, visually beautiful pieces of mathematics, probably the most beautiful pieces of mathematics I have ever seen. So, can you glue opposite edges of the square? This is what I want you to think about for next time. Please, please, please don't forget to share this video if you enjoyed it. It's really vital for the future of the channel. I cannot insist on it enough. Please, please, please share this video. It's extremely important. Uh, you can also check this link about the space-time of special relativity. It's a science world article I wrote, which is much more complete than what I've told you in this, uh, in this video. If you want to jump ahead and check a little bit of general relativity, you can also check this science world article. And I hope I'll see you next time.